Therefore, having initially left Egypt in the middle of the first month, and because Israel arrived at Sinai at the beginning of the third month, we can determine that they must have been traversing the Red Sea in the second month, Iyar. It is not a great stretch to suggest that Israel crossed the Red Sea on the 17th day of the second month. This means that covering by water as a symbol of death and resurrection took place at the same time of year in both instances. Shalom, I'm Yaakov. Welcome to Line Upon Line. In this episode, we continue our study of the first book of the Torah, Bereshit, the book of Genesis, with chapter 7. Let's take a look now at chapter 7 of Genesis, beginning with the first verse. And saying, Hashem, yud heh vav heh, to Noah, come, you and all your household, into the vessel. For you have I seen a righteous one before my face in this generation. Up to this point, the name Elohim has been used, indicating the just judge of the universe. Now, the sacred name yud heh vav Hashem Adonai is used to convey God's mercy. In his mercy, God redeems Noah and his family whom by their own merits did not deserve to be saved. For it is Noah alone whom God speaks of when he says, For you, singular, have I seen righteous. Noah's righteousness, of course, is the fruit of God walking with him and Noah's acceptance of God's redemptive purpose. Notice the remes, the hint, that's seen in the names used. The merciful one calls Noah, whose name means rest and comfort, to come into a place of safety, security, rest and comfort. Why? Because God has perceived Noah's inherent desire to serve him and accept his offer of covering atonement. This has set Noah apart in his generation which is why the text reads, Bador Haze, in the generation, this one. Kepha, or Peter, the Talmud, disciple of Yeshua HaMashiach, writes, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into the abyss and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a deluge upon the world of the ungodly. 2 Peter 2, 4 through 5. Noah is seen as a herald or a preacher of righteousness. This can be interpreted to mean that Noah himself is a symbol and therefore a sign to all generations, one whose story heralds righteousness. Additionally, it can be understood to refer to the fact that Noah warned his own generation of the coming judgment of God. The writer of the book to the Hebrews, probably Barnavi, Barnabas, writes, Through trust, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverent awe prepared a vessel for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Hebrews 11 verse 7. The writer of the book to the Hebrews confirms the fact that Noah's salvation, like that of all redeemed human beings, is based on his having accepted the gift of God through faith. In Hebrew, imunah, faith, trust, reliance upon. Though he was comparatively righteous in his generation, nonetheless, 
he was saved by faith through atonement and received the righteousness of God in obedience to God's call. Noach's obedience was also a seal and a confirmation of the coming judgment of the flood. The Darash, or comparative teaching here, is one that teaches security and rest through obedience. We cannot hope to obtain rest and comfort from God if we fail to act in obedience to his call. Yeshua says, Come unto me, all you who grow weary, tired, and exhausted, and are burdened by an oppressive load, and I will give you rest, comfort, peace, and wholeness. Matisyahu or Matthew 11.28 Bereshit 7, verse 2. Of every beast, the clean, pure, you shall take seven, seven of the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean, not pure, them take two, the male and his female. Also flying creatures of the heavens, by sevens, the male and the female, to keep offspring, seed, alive upon the face of all the earth. Although it's Moshe, Moses, recording these details at Sinai, he is not retrospectively imposing his own view of clean and unclean animals. Rather, he's recording what has been revealed to him by God, both directly through divine revelation and indirectly through the passing down of oral history via the patriarchs. Noach was aware of a distinction between clean and unclean animals and between the holy and the mundane long before the giving of the Torah at Sinai. God, knowing the end from the beginning, ensures that the clean animals will be plentiful in the future for use in the sacrificial system and as kosher flesh, designations which will follow at a much later date pursuant to God's giving of animal life for food, in Bereshit, Genesis 9, 3. Both clean and unclean animals are brought into the vessel in breeding pairs for the purpose of sustaining the existence of each kind, meaning that subsequent varieties of species are adapted from the DNA present in each base pair that were secured in the vessel. This silences arguments from secular science that suggest that there was not enough room on the vessel for all the varieties of species that exist today. Verse 2 and 3 begin a rhythm of fullness, using the number 7 to signify both the unique sacred role of the clean animals and the fullness of the work of bringing all the various kinds of land-dwelling animals into the safe haven of the vessel. Bereshit 7, 4. For in seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and nights, and wipe out all living substance that I have fashioned upon the face of the ground. The seven days are employed in mercy, giving the populace a final opportunity to repent, and as a sign of fullness. Seven is also attached to grief in Hebrew thought. Thus, Rashi suggests that these seven days were days of mourning for the loss of Metushalach, Methuselah. The forty days and forty nights are both literal and symbolic. The number forty signifies the convergence of the fullness or goal of something and the birth of something new. Bereshit 7, 5 And fashioned Noah all that which Hashem instructed him. And Noach was six hundred years old, and deluge, floodwaters, came upon the earth. As God prepares to bring judgment against all that he has fashioned, Asa, Noach fashions, Asa, the practical elements commanded by God for his deliverance. Thus we see Elohim, the judge, and yud heh vav -Heh, the Merciful One, at work in the redemptive story of humanity. Bereshit 7, verse 7. And Noach went in, and his sons, 
and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Based on the phrase because of the waters of the flood and verse seven ten, which says after seven days, it is possible to interpret an additional seven days, making a total of 14 days prior to the waters reaching a destructive level. If this is the correct reading, then Noah and his household didn't go into the vessel until the deluge had begun. This indicates that at the time they entered the vessel, the flooding had not yet reached unusually high levels. However, by the time the general populace realised the gravity of what was happening, it hit them like a tidal wave, both literally and metaphorically. Because they had been going about life as usual, presuming that the flood would recede and the land would return to its normal state. The Abuita Chadasha, the New Testament, explains that the returning of the Messiah will happen in a similar way. Matisiyahu, or Matthew 24, 37-39, reads, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the vessel, and they didn't understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man. B. Bereshit 7 verse 8. From the beast, the clean, pure, and from the beast, not clean, not pure, and from the flying creatures, fowls, and of everything that creeps upon the earth, there went in two and two to Noah into the vessel, the male and the female, as God, Elohim, had commanded Noah. The animals, possibly driven by the rising waters, were drawn by Ha'alochim, the judge, toward Noah, whose name means rest, just as Noah had come into God's rest and security within the vessel. Noah's obedience to God meant that God worked in Noah's favor to fulfill all that he had asked Noah, bringing the animals to him. When we obey God in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds, he works in our favour to bring about the fulfilment of that which he has instructed. Bereshit 7.10 And it came to pass, after seven days, the waters of the flood came over the earth. These may be seven more days, or they may simply be the seven days mentioned previously. Either way, the waters rose gradually and were now at a level where they were covering the land, but not yet deep enough to float the vessel. Bereshit 7, 11. In the 600th year of the life of Noah, in the month, the second, in the 17th day of the month, in that day, broke open all the springs of the great deep, and the windows of heaven were opened. The very specific dating of these events is intended to convey an historical point in time that refutes conjecture regarding the supposed mythology of the elements of this story. The ancient Hebrew recipients of this text read this as history. While Rashi and Rabbi Eliezer of the Talmud seek to link the dating of these events to Rosh Hashanah or Yom HaTeruah, the day of soundings, saying that the second month must therefore be Macheshvan, I prefer the interpretation of Rabbi Yehoshua, who maintains that the second month is the month Iyar, the month which follows Nisan. You can find these teachings in Talmud Bavli, Rosh Hashanah 11b. This seems most likely because since the time of the Exodus, the time of the writing down of the Torah, the Hebrew religious months have been determined according to the command of God to keep Nisan as the first month. This is significant in relationship to the story of the flood because the month of Nisan commemorates Israel's deliverance from bondage in Egypt and metaphorically from slavery to sin and spiritual darkness. 
Israel arrived at Sinai in the third month. Therefore, having initially left Egypt in the middle of the first month, and because Israel arrived at Sinai at the beginning of the third month, we can determine that they must have been traversing the Red Sea in the second month, Iyar. It is not a great stretch to suggest that Israel crossed the Red Sea on the 17th day of the second month. This means that covering by water as a symbol of death and resurrection took place at the same time of year in both instances. The symbolism of the name Red Sea being an obvious allusion to blood atonement. The flood also marks Noah's deliverance from the wickedness of a debauched generation. Both Noah and the Israelites are delivered through a great act of God's judgment and through the symbolic cleansing of water. This in turn corresponds to the deliverance of all humanity through the covering, atoning flood of Yeshua's blood, which bore fruit in the second month, the month following Nisan, when the risen Messiah appeared bodily to his followers for 40 days prior to returning to the heavens 10 days after the 17th of Iyar. In Hebrew thought, the number 10 is a symbol of completion and fulfillment. Thus, the Messiah Yeshua completes and fills the work of covering, and at the same time, the judgment of God is issued against humanity for the final time, offering escape from the final flood, Yom Hadin, the day of judgment, through the second Adam, Yeshua, formerly represented by Noah who calls us to come into his vessel, his ark, which is the community of believers, the ecclesia, the body of believers, both Yodim, Jews, and Goyim, and people from other tribes. Just as Noach's righteous status covered his family, Yeshua's righteous status covers the family of God. The waters above and below the firmament gush forth in a deluge that covers the face of the earth. This is deliberate language that is used to recall the beginning of creation, where we read in Bereshit 1, 1-2, In the beginning, creating from nothing, Elohim made the waters of the sky, and he made the earth, and the earth came into existence, desolate and vacant, and darkness was over the face of the deep, surging subterranean waters, and the spirit, wind, breath of Elohim, brooded like a mother eagle, relaxing over the face of the waters. Noah and his family are witnessing a judgment that will act as a catalyst for a type of new or renewed creation. This is an obvious foreshadowing of the judgment of God at the end of days, which will be followed by a new heavens and a new earth in fulfillment and completion of God's redemptive plan for humanity. Noah, whose name means rest, comfort, is seen as a type for the second Adam, the second human, a reference to the King Messiah Yeshua, who is salvation. Thus, rest and comfort will come to humanity through salvation himself. Bereshit 7, 12, and 13. And it came to pass that the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In substance, the same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Yephet, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, into the vessel. The same day means the same day that the flood began or began to reach the level of danger as previously alluded to. Noach and his family alone were redeemed in the vessel. This is confirmed by the New Testament. In 1 Peter 3, 18-20 we read, For Messiah also has suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, 
which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the vessel, the ark, was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Second Peter 2, 4-5 reads, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into the abyss, and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a deluge upon the world of the ungodly. Bereshit 7, 14 and 15. They, and every living creature, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth after his kind, and every flying creature after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in to Noah, into the vessel, two and two of all flesh, which had the breath of living, Wachayim. Four of the five categories of created life from Bereshit 1, 21 through 25 are mentioned here. The fifth category, sea creatures, were able to survive outside the vessel. Bereshit 7, 16. And they that went in, went in male, Zahar, and female of all flesh, entering as instructed, as a sign of Elohim, and closed yud he vav he around about. The Hebrew zahar, used here to name the male of the pair, comes from the root zahor, meaning to remember. Hashem, yud he vav he has remembered his creation in the same sense that he later remembers Noah in Bereshit 8.1. In this sense, remember means to acknowledge, rather than to recall something forgotten. God commanded the building of the vessel, but in the end it is God himself who completes the work of the vessel by closing the vessel and securing it around Noah, his family, and the animals. The Hebrew text gives the impression of a cosmic hug from the Creator. It is Hashem, yod he vav he, mercy himself, who surrounds and secures the occupants of the vessel. He is the seal and shield that protects them from the judgment of the flood. In fact, using the meaning mercy to represent the holy name, we could read, and mercy enfolded them. Bereshit 7, 17 and 18. And it came to pass that the deluge, flood, was forty days upon the earth, and became great the waters, and lifted up the vessel, and it rose up above the earth, and mighty waters became exceedingly upon the earth, and to walk the vessel went upon the face of the waters. The vessel was lifted in stages. It seems that the progression of the deluge is intended to prevent the capsizing of the vessel. First, it's lifted. Then it walks or begins to move across the waters. Bereshit 7, 19. And the waters were mighty exceedingly upon the earth and covered all the mountains at their highest that were beneath all the heavens. The waters were apparently high enough to cover all the mountains beneath the heavens. Some seek to qualify the extent of the flood waters by saying that the Hebrew Ha'aretz can refer to a localized section of earth. However, the phrase beneath all the heavens clearly refutes this. Additionally, the New Testament confirms that of all humanity, only Noah and his seven family members were saved from the flood. Bereshit 7, 20. By 15 amma, or 7.5 metres high, did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. The referencing of the covering depth of the waters is intended to show that the vessel, which is twice this height, with less than a third of its height below sea level, is easily able to float above the nearest peaks without being damaged or grounded and torn in violent seas. 
Bereshit 7, 21 and 22. And died all flesh that moved upon the earth, both of flying creatures and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and every human being. All which had breath, wind, spirit, living in its nostrils, all that was in the dry land died. This confirms the fact that the creatures that died were creatures of the land and skies. While it's true that sea creatures utilize oxygen from the water, they do not have the breath of life in the same sense that the Hebrew intends it here. The intimate nature of the description, being the breath, spirit of living, breathed into the nostrils, seems to indicate a counterpoint to the act of God's breathing Adam into life in the beginning. Finally, Bereshit 7, 23 and 24. And wiped out all living substance which was upon the face of the ground, both human being and cattle, and the creeping things, and the flying creatures of the heavens were wiped out from the earth, and remaining surely only Noah and they that were with him in the vessel, and mighty the waters were upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. The one hundred and fifty days indicate the length of time that the water was maintained at this level, 7.5 metres above the highest peak. In the next episode, we'll look at Bereshit, Genesis chapter 8. The Line Upon Line podcast is available on both Spotify and Apple Podcast. If you're tuning in for the first time, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, liking and following our Facebook page, and also following us on whatever social media platforms you use. In addition to this, if you have friends and family who might be interested, please share this episode with them. Thanks in advance for your support. I hope you can find time to join me again for the next episode. Shalom B'Shem HaMashiach Yeshua HaMelech.